Hey, I'd like to welcome you to this week's uh, Sunday School lesson. Uh, I'm Butch Ross from Winters Fort Baptist Church, and and I'd just like to say this week's lesson is on is citizens, and we're coming out of Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 14. If you have your quarterly, you can turn to that lesson, or you can turn to your in your Bible. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we'd like to thank you for this time together. Lord, we thank you for our church. We thank you for our pastor and his wife and family, Lord. We just ask a special blessing upon them. And Lord, we ask the blessing upon each and every person that's listening to this message, Lord. Lord, we just ask you to give them the peace that only you can give, Lord. And Lord, we ask a special prayer upon our country, Lord, as we go through this pandemic, that you'll just continue to let people feel safe, Lord, protect them, look after them. But Lord, let them know that if they know you, no matter what happens, everything will be okay. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now again, today's lesson is citizens, and we're coming out of Romans chapter 13. And, and we'll start out uh, that uh, believers should seek to represent Christ well in their communities and the world. And, and one of the reasons that I like to say a lot of times, you know, when our children act in ways that we're not proud of, sometimes the power that makes us the maddest is the way it reflects on us and our family. And so, you know what? We represent Jesus Christ and, and God to the world, and it is a reflection on God and the Lord Jesus Christ and how we act. And the key doctrine here this week says civil government being ordained of God, it is the duty of Christians to render loyal obedience thereto in all things not contrary to God's word. You want to know what's right or wrong? You look in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, it's right. If it says it's wrong in the Bible, then it is wrong. And although the authorities deserve respect and taxes, we need to remember that God alone is the ultimate authority. And we're to show love to everyone. So we start out in verses 1 through 4. And it says, Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to, to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Uh, in verse 4, it's talking about we're to submit to governing authorities as long as it's not against the word of God. As long as it's not immoral or something that goes against God's word, if the authorities tell us to do it, we're supposed to do it. In Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. In verse 2 it says, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceful, gentle, showing all humility to all men. And in First Peter chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, which is authority. And in Mark 12, verse 17, it says, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. And that's a pretty well-known verse. And what we need to remember <coughs> that it's telling us is no authority can exist unless God allows it to exist. God puts governing authorities in place. And, and one of the examples is, is when Pilate claimed to have authority over Jesus when he was getting ready to put him to death, Jesus answered Pilate and said, you would have no authority 
over me at all if it hadn't been given to you from above. So Pilate really had no say-so in whether Jesus would be put to death or not. It was all by choice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 3, it's telling us that God has given governments the task of maintaining order in society. And, and I'll, here's a good example that I'd like to bring up, I think is a good example. Say I get a speeding ticket, and, and here's what I would probably tell Joette. The officer should have, should have had better things to do than out giving me a ticket. He need to be looking after crim, hunting criminals. But when someone almost runs me off the road because they're speeding, here's what I ask. Where are the troopers? So, you know, good conduct is the antidote for fear of authority. Uh, if you're driving the speed limit, I don't think it really matters if the highway patrolman's behind you or not. Uh, some people get scared and they start slowing down. But if you're following the rules of the road, then you have nothing to worry about when they do get behind you. And the government has a right, God has given the government a right to punish those who break the law. And here's what Paul reasoned, that the evil being punished and the good being rewarded were in line with God's moral principles. And so then we come over to verses 5 through 7. Verses 5 through 7 says, Therefore you must submit not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants, continually attending to these tasks, pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. Uh, the first reason for submission is you will be punished. But the second reason it tells us in chapter, in verse 5, is because of our conscience. Uh, conscience to a Christian is a moral sensitivity to God's will. Paul urged believers to do the right thing. And in verse 7, where it's talking about believers should pay our taxes, we should pay them on time and with a good attitude. And I know that's kind of hard to do a lot of times. I know when we owe taxes at the end of the year, me and Joette, we never do pay them till like May the 15th, more April 15th, excuse me. And we always are not too happy when we have to mail that check. But Paul says we're to pay them on time and with a good attitude. Paul gave us four categories, <coughs> taxes, or direct. An indirect thing we're supposed to pay is tolls and other fees that the government has. We're also to show respect to the government and our leaders, and we're to show honor to our leaders. First Timothy chapter 2 verse two, verses 1 through 2 says, pray for all men. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Uh, it says in verse 2, it says, For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. However, absolute authority belongs to God alone. And we need to remember that. Absolute authority belongs to God alone. And believers must always evaluate whether the demands of authorities is in light of the gospel. Does it line up with the Bible? And that's what we need to do. And to sum up verse 7, it says believers are to repay all obligations. If we owe somebody, we're to pay them back. And in verse 8, it comes up, and verse 8 says, Do not owe anyone anything. It slept to love one another. <clears throat> For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, 
there is an obligation that we can never repay fully. And the obligation we can never pay fully is love. And our debt of love it is because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he gave his life because he loved us that much. And God sacrificed his own son so that we could be saved and we could have eternal life. And, and I will tell you this, I have five girls and there is not one of them I would sacrifice for any person that I know. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be nailed to that cross, spit upon, tormented, made fun of, and then he kept just saying, I love you that much. And so that is a debt we can never repay. Our is, but, and I'll tell you this too, the Bible tells us that our debt of love is owed to both believers and non-believers, both to those friendly toward us and those who treat us bad. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And then we come to verse 9 to 10. It says, the commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. And when Paul is quoting these four commandments, these are the four commandments that deal with how we're supposed to treat other people. And it says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, and do not steal. It says, do not covet. Then he summed these up, four commandments up, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Then in verse 39, it says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. You know, if we would follow these two commandments, then we don't, don't need the other commandments. Because look at verse, again, in verse 37, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then like in 39, it says, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments, again, I'll repeat this, all the law is hung upon this. And then in verse 11, we come to verse 11. And verse 11 says, besides this, since you know the time, it is already the hour for you to awake up from sleep because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. You know, we as Christians, we're to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ. And, and my nephew, Ethan, uh, he always tells me, he calls me about five or six times a day, at least maybe 10. And each time he says, Uncle Butch, what are we going to do if Christ comes back tonight? Or what are we going to do if Christ comes during wrestling season? What are we going to do if Christ comes while we're out bailing hay? He always, and then he'll say, what if he comes during football season? And I always tell him, I say, you know, Ethan, we're going to tell him thank you for what he done. We're going to be excited he come to get us. And then Ethan will say this too. He says, Uncle Butch, what if I die tonight? He, and I said, well, he said, well, we're going to, I'm going to be in heaven. I'm going to see Mama and Papa, and he starts naming them and just goes on through the whole list. So, you know what, that's the way we're to be. We're to be ready for the return of Jesus because nobody knows the hour. And, and 1 Thessalonians tells us in, verse, in chapter 5, verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. No one knows when Jesus 
will return. But, and I put a but in there, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that one day he is coming back. So we don't know the hour, but without a shadow of a doubt, we know that one day he is coming. And every day, listen, every day is one day closer than when Jesus returns. And then we come to verses 12 and 13, and it says, The night is nearly over, and the day is near. So let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk with decency, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and proximity, not in quarreling and jealousy. You know, Works of the darkness. You want to know what works of the darkness is? Those are acts of sin. And works of light are acts of righteousness. So, you know, when we were saved, we became new creations in Christ. We're to discard the deeds of darkness. We're, we are, as believers, are commanded to put on the armor of righteousness, which is the armor of light, it tells us here. And so First Thessalonians Chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 says, But you, you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark. For this day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So I pray here today that if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your life has been changed. And, and and one of the things that here it says in these verses is we as believers are to walk with decency. That means proper behavior. We as believers were to behave as we are in the daytime. Most of the sin that takes place is at night because people are ashamed of it. They want to kind of hide from it. But you know what? We are not to live in carousing and drunkenness. That means excessive drinking and partying. We're not to live with sexual impurities. We're not to live quarreling with each other and jealous over other people. We're to live like Jesus Christ lived his life. And then we come to verse 14. And it says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make plans to gratify the desires of the flesh. You know, we as believers are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We should mirror the way he walked on this earth. And I will tell you, without the only way that you will ever know how to Jesus Christ lived, how Jesus Christ acted, how we're supposed to live our lives, is to be in prayer, be in the Bible, and have devotions each and every day so we can learn how he lived his life. And believers are to embrace Christ to the point that they are transformed into his likeness by the renewing of their minds. You know, I, I've told this a whole lot at Sunday school. If somebody comes up and asks you, are you a Christian, do you, or, or, do you go to church? Instead of asking you where you go to church, you need to go home and look in the mirror and examine your life. Because if they say, where you go to church, that's okay. But if they say, do you go to church, then you need to see how you're living, how you're walking, and, and how your example is being as a Christian. And then let us pray here tonight, and we'll close. And I really do appreciate you doing, but let me tell you that on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, at Leonard's Fort Baptist Church, we have car church, and it is really a great time. We have great singing, we have great preaching, and even though we're not out socializing with each other, you see people that from our church, and, and you know that they're doing okay because they come to car church. We have a lot of guests who are coming to car church, so I invite you that if your church is not doing anything or you do not have a church home, that this Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, you come up to Leonard's Fort Baptist Church and just listen to Jay bring the word 
of God in the way that God had him, has him do it. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we'd like to thank you again for the day you gave us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to do this lesson, Lord. And Lord, we say another special prayer for our pastor, his family, and our whole church family, Lord. We just ask you to be with them. Lord, we ask you again to be with each and every person that listens to this message. Lord, we just pray that they know your Son is Lord and Savior, and Lord, that you'll give them the peace of knowing that no matter what happens, everything is going to be okay. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Amen.